Dr. Amber Hasib. Uh, she's a young and aspiring orthopedic surgeon uh, who is now part of our foot and ankle team. And her topic is related to a common problem that we face all the time. So Dr. Amber, would you like to start your presentation? Yes, um, good morning. Thank you, Prof. Vivek, for the lovely, lovely introduction. Um, not uh, expiring, but aspiring <laughs> young foot and ankle surgeon. And uh, good morning to everyone else, and welcome to breakfast at uh, FOM. So I'll, let me share my screen first. Okay, can, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay, so um, before I begin, can I, the, the, the listeners from the audience, just shout out into the, into the chat group as to how many of you can't actually put your foot down uh, early in the morning when you take your first step out of the bed. Okay, so my topic is about plantar fasciitis. But is it really fasciitis or is it fasciosis? And is there really inflammation going on? We'll find out soon. Okay, I will just talk about a bit of an overview of this topic because it is quite a common condition. And I think quite a number of uh, people, not just orthopedic surgeons, but general physicians, um, rheumatologists encountered such patients in their clinics. So it affects 10% of the population. 8% of all injuries that are diagnosed around the foot and ankle region, and 10% actually fail conservative therapy. So then you wonder, why do you or certain people suffer from plantar fasciosis or fasciitis? People who are obese are predisposed. People with um, reduced uh, ankle dorsiflexion due to gastroc tightness or Achilles uh, tightness, or poor biomechanics um, that is deformity, such as pest planers, pest cavers, and people who do a lot of uh, weight-bearing endurance activities, people whose job requires uh, prolonged walking and prolonged standing. So I want to debunk a myth about plantar fasciitis. Whenever we shoot a plain radiograph, we always see a calcaneus spur and we jump about it and we want it to be excised immediately. But the truth is, in cadaveric studies, we found out that the spur is not actually found within the plantar epineurosis. It's actually within the flexor digitorum brevis over here, which lies deeper to the plantar epineurosis. So the spur is actually not the cause of societies. And you can see here as evidence in literature as well, that 50% of the patients with heel pain will have spurs. And 63% of patients with no heel pain also were found to have the calcaneus spurs. So a histopathological uh, study of the fascia showed that there is actually degeneration with micro tests within the fascia itself, which leads to necrosis of the collagen fibers and hyperplasia of the angiofibroblast. And this happens because of repetitive microtrauma. So the term, which is a misnomer, fasciitis, is actually plantar fasciosis. There is no inflammation to begin with. It's actually a degenerative process. So just a bit about the clinical presentation, because I think it's important to know and to differentiate plantar fasciitis pain with other uh, heel pain. So it's, it falls under the category of heel pain syndrome, commonly at the, at the insertion, which is at the medial aspect of the plantar fascia, as you can see in the picture, or sometimes they have pain along the medial border of the foot. So usually patients will complain of start-up pain. That means when they take their first step out of the bed 
it's extremely painful. And as they walk about, it becomes less, but it worsens by the end of the day. The reason behind this is that when, we, when you sleep at night, the fascia tries to heal and it undergoes fibrosis. And when you take the first step, it stretches it back out and that causes the pain. So I'm not going to show you a pain radiograph because that's common. But if you were to order an MRI and if you can see the picture at the top, this is the normal fascia, which is not thickened and the surrounding tissue, there is no edema. So now if you look at the image on the right hand side, you can see that the plantar fascia is uh, quite thickened compared to the normal one and there is edema around the fat pad. And it, studies have shown that if you were to do an MRI and if there is bone edema in T2 image of a person with plantar fasciosis, you, and if you were to give them steroid injection, they are not going to do well with the steroid injection. So what are, what are the interventions that I can offer with, with somebody suffering from this condition? As a mainstay, there's always a non-operative approach and an operative approach. And fortunately or unfortunately, for plantar fasciitis, non-surgical treatment is actually the mainstay of treating plantar fasciitis. And the commonest would be lifestyle modification, modification of your shoe wear and physiotherapy. Some do give pharmacological treatment such as NSAID. I will dwell into it a bit later on. So what do you mean by lifestyle modification? I do not need you to change your job, but if you are obese, probably you can resort to exercise and diet change so that you can bring down your weight. With regards to shoe wear modif modification, I would advise you to meet a foot and ankle surgeon or even a pedo orthotist before you uh, resort to uh, your shoe wear modification. So under the orthotics, we have got inserts and night splints. So you can, if you, if you have got plantar fasciitis due to a uh, flat foot, which is flexible, you can have a medial, rigid medial arch uh, supporters. You can resort to night splints, but you have to be careful to get the precise uh, night splint, which will keep the, the toe or your foot in dorsiflexion when you sleep at night. So this helps the fascia heal in a stretch position. Uh, if you have got a uh, limited dorsiflexion of your ankle due to tightness, by having a heel lift on your shoe will, uh, benefit, will, will benefit as well. And you can put in silicone inserts over the heel, but that's just symptomatic uh, relief. Okay, there was a study that compared NSAIDs with placebo, and it shows that people who were given NSAIDs had a better improvement in pain. However, it wasn't statistically significant uh, um, between the placebo group. And also, nobody has, uh, has studied giving NSAIDs alone to plantar fasciitis patients, meaning that they were always given some other modality of physiotherapy. Okay. When it comes to injections, uh, I know that steroids are commonly given. Uh, other options are PRP, local, local anesthesia, and also Botox. But you have to remember that there is limited evidence of the effectiveness of either of these in, in reducing the pain. Or if at all, if it's given, it's short term. And the major problem, which I see in my clinic, is patients who come having received steroid injections, with fat pad atrophy and fat pad atrophy leads to a lot of pain and it's a condition that's not reversible. And also if the injection was given uh, at the wrong location, it can cause rupture of the plantar fascia itself. So if you do decide to give steroid injection, uh, I would advise it to be given under ultrasound guidance so you know precisely uh, where you, you're injecting the steroid. Physiotherapy, uh, I, I will talk, I'll tell you a bit more detail about uh, stretching exercises that can be done at home. And uh, apart from that, if you do have the advantage of having a physiotherapy center and you could send your patients for extracorporeal shockwave therapy, which we do not have in University of Malaya in PPUM, but we do have the ultrasound and heat therapy that helps with the plantar fasciitis. So, 
this is one exercise that you can do at home. So before you jump off the bed early in the morning, uh, cross over one leg over the other. Use your hand, your fingers to stretch your toes. Use the opposite hand to feel the tautness of the fascia and hold this for about 10 seconds and try to do it for about 10 times uh, each side before you start walking from the bed. This second stretch is uh, for if you have got tightness of your gastrocnemius. So you can either look at the first picture, your at the edge of the wall and the second one is behind it and you have to make sure that it does not lift off from the floor when you're doing it and you press against the 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 wall so in this picture you can see it's pressing against the wall so you would feel a stretch along your your calf at this area so this one again you should hold for about 10 to 20 seconds um about 10 times each side and do it as frequently as you can. I would recommend three times a day if possible. Another alternative is a, a heel raise on a stool or even your staircase if you are stable enough. If you are not comfortable doing this method, you can uh, buy a slant board. It's readily available on Lazada or Shopee. Depending on the material, it can cost you about 80 to 300 ringgit. And the, the inclination is adjustable. So you can stand up on it upright in the morning while brushing your tooth and let your let your gastro stretch. If and if you if you if you can't resort to any of this, then you can see in the picture here down on the right hand side, you can sit on the floor, keep your knee extended, make sure your back is upright. You can either use a terra band or a towel to help dorsiflex your your ankle and maintain that for ten seconds. Yeah, I'd like you to focus on the on the three pictures at the bottom. So this is another exercise that helps uh, stretch the fascia and also train the intrinsic muscles of your foot. So you can do a you can either use a tennis ball or you can use a Lacoste ball. So you can do you can roll out your foot over the ball, sixty seconds per side. You can also do a, a comp compression over the heel, sixty seconds per side as well. And toe curl is where you grab, try to grab the ball with your toe and, um, and release it and try to do it for 10 reps. This will specifically train your intrinsic muscles of your, of your foot, small muscles of your foot. Okay, so now when, after we're done with conservative, we talk about, you, you ask, okay, what if conservative fails? I normally give a, a six months, uh, time frame to people and provided that they are compliant to the physiotherapy given to them. But having said that, surgery, there is role for surgery, but you have to be very careful when you offer surgery to certain patients. So because uh, less than 50% of the patients are actually satisfied with surgery and they still continue to have uh, functional limitations. And there are studies that say that because plantar fasciitis is a chronic condition, it leads to a lot of psychological aspects. Quite a lot of patients tend to, to suffer from depression. So you have to be very, very and not offer surgery to this group. So then what group can you offer surgery to? Normally, I would offer surgery to people who, have, who are recalcitrant, chronic, really chronic plantar fasciitis, or the ones that have failed multiple injections. So what are the operative options? Before I jump into the a, a little less invasive, just talk about open surgery. Open surgery is um, a, you, where you can do partial fasciotomy or you can do cancellia osteotomies. This is mostly to correct the, the flat foot or the cable virus deformities that uh, patients have. But open surgery normally we do not do just for plantar fasciitis. We do it when they have got other foot and ankle problems. Because when you do a partial fasciotomy, there is risk of rupture of the plantar fascia, which can lead to flat foot. And quite a lot of patients after open release uh, suffer from lateral column pain, and you can also uh, damage the neurovascular structures around that area. So let me touch a bit on uh, topaz. I'll share a video here with you guys.
uh, I hope the video is visible to you guys. Is the video uh, visible? Yep. Yes, clear. Okay, so uh, okay, so start back again. Uh, make it full screen. Okay, this is a video of a topaz surgery. Uh, we it, it has to be done in the theater. So you can see, I'll pause the video for a while. So you can see that uh, these uh, dots are made five mm apart in a grid, uh, in a grid um, pattern, and a local anesthesia is uh, being administered. So I'll play back the video. So after the local anesthesia is administered, we use a 0.6 mm K wire to penetrate the skin. So this K wire is just used to penetrate the skin until you feel the tautness of the plantar fascia and not penetrate through the fascia itself. Okay, and this grid pattern is actually made over the area of where the patient complains of pain. It doesn't have to be this size. It can be smaller depending the region of the, of the pain. After that, a topaz one, you can see the topaz one is being inserted through the holes that were made with the K wires. And this topaz one, when it hits the fascia, you you press the topaz pedal and 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 uh, release the radio frequency ablation technique. And uh, this is just to show you on an X-ray image showing that this is the K wire, my arrow. So the K wire rests just above the plantar fascia, and now you can see the topaz uh, probe going through, and it penetrates through the fascia. So this is the spur. And this is your, your border of the calcaneum. So your fascia is about at this area. All right. Okay. So the advantage of uh, topaz over uh, open fascia release is that day two post-op, the patient is able to return back to their daily activities. Um, it has a quicker pain relief as quick as about um, as early as about one week. Total healing time is about six to twelve weeks duration, and there will be less complications as compared to an open surgery. So a bit about the endoscopic. Okay, this video is showing a um, shaver that's shaving off the degenerated bits of the plantar fascia. And sorry. Okay, and if you see this, this bony uh, piece, this is the calcaneal spur, and we use the kerosen to to rongerate off. There. And then you continue to shave off the remainder of the of the fascia that's degenerated. So the advantage of uh, of uh, of uh, endoscopic would be that it's minimally invasive and um, we can take away the calcaneal spur as well and also get rid of the of the degenerated fascia and we don't really need to do a plantar fascia release in these cases. Okay, then that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amber, for the very informative and comprehensive talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? See the chat. The question box is empty. Would anybody yeah. like to ask anything? There are six. We have six minutes remaining for this session. Yes, Dr. Amber, you're, you're saying in the initial part of your talk that you do not need to remove the plantar fascia. Uh, but when you do an arthroscopic uh, debridement, you, are, you show that you actually remove the, the spur. So is it important to remove the spur? Um, it is not uh, necessarily important because it's actually not the cause of the problem. But in order to properly debride the fascia that's degenerated, you need to remove the spur. If not, you will not be able to get below it. That is, uh, is releasing the plantar fascia a treatment for plantar fasciitis? Uh, I wouldn't 
normally for recalcitrant cases. Mm. It's not a mainstay of treatment. Definitely not. Uh, Prof Sagunan is asking a question. He said, why is the outcome of surgery not as expected? Because when we do surgery, we, we are not uh, getting rid of the inherent problem, which could be the tightness of the fascia itself, or even the, the tightness of the gastrocnemius and other underlying uh, uh, conditions that actually lead to the, the, the uh, fasciitis process itself. And normally when we have offered surgery, it's to patients who are really, really chronic. So their fascia is already degenerated and we're just trying to get rid of the degenerated bits of it. So the outcome is, uh, is not good. Okay, then um, Dr. Ng from Pitts is asking, will it recur after a topaz procedure? Uh, come again, Prof. What is he asking? Will will the condition will the, will recur the, after after a topaz procedure? Uh, after a topaz procedure, if you were to follow a proper rehabilitation, it should not recur. Okay. What kind of footwear would you recommend uh, for a person who has plantar fasciitis? If somebody has got plantar fasciitis with no foot deformities, um, anything with a uh, with a soft uh, so is, is good enough but if you have got a flexible flat foot and you have got plantar fasciitis then it is better if you use a arch support along with it what about walking barefooted at home would you recommend that or would you recommend them to use a footwear at, even in the house I would recommend to use a footwear There's a question here. Uh, Dr. Wong Kai Rei is asking, may I know if the degenerative fascia is removed, does it need to be replaced? <laughs> uh, well, it can't be replaced. Uh, normally, when we have got tendinitis or tendinopathies, we, we just shave off the degenerated part and not the whole fascia itself because it cannot be replaced. That is why sometimes we do offer PRP, hoping that it can heal itself. And uh, but that's why when we do topaz, uh, topaz is actually meant to um, enhance the healing of the fascia, the inherent healing process. But it can't be replaced like uh, tendon transfers. In your practice, uh, do you regularly inject PRP? Uh, yes, Prof. I err more towards PRP rather than steroids. Will treatment of psychological issue help resolve? Uh, it will not. It will not. It just happens that it's a chronic condition that takes pretty long to, uh, to resolve. Six months, year, two years, and it affects their lifestyle, their work. So seeking psychological treatment will not take away the plantar fasciitis. Okay, Dr. Sharif Ahmed uh, Hamid is asking, may I know which class of PRP you use? Which class of PRP? Yes. Uh, right now, we are using the, the one that's available uh, under Northrell, which is actually PEV, which is the, the activated uh, platelet uh, PRP. Okay, Dr. Fong is asking, uh, why do you prefer PRP over steroids? I think I mentioned earlier, a uh, problem with steroids is that uh, the outcome is uh, short-lived and uh, there is no proven evidence that it actually works. And the main drawback is the side effects, which is the uh, heel pad atrophy. As we know that our heel pad is uh, mainly cushion, is a fat cushion. Below it, there is a very thin layer of muscle and right below that is our calcaneal bone. So once if you inject the steroid, uh, it can cause heel pad atrophy. And after that, the, your calcaneum becomes, comes into direct contact with the, with the floor 
and that causes a lot of direct pressure and pain over the heel and that is a condition that cannot be reversed okay thank you dr amber i think we uh, we'll just entertain that many questions for now because we have already reached our time limit and i would like to um, welcome the next chairperson to take over the uh, next session of this breakfast symposium